Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this morning, giving us this time, space, and opportunity, Lord, to come together to meet with you, Lord, and meet with your people, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, you could call this a family reunion, Lord, where we're all coming together. Um, but our main purpose isn't just to hang out, isn't to socialize, Lord. Our main purpose is to glorify you. Our purpose is also to hear from you, to be made more like you, our Heavenly Father, because we are your children, Lord. So I pray right now you'd fill us all with your Spirit to receive what you have declared for us this morning. You would fill me with your Spirit to speak only your words and not my own. Lord, that we would leave here more like you than when we came in. Lord, we also pray for our unsafe family members. For many of us, we've been praying for decades, years, praying that they would come to know you. And so, Lord, we pray right now you would put that on their heart. You would convict them. They would repent and believe on you. So they, that way they wouldn't just be part of our blood family, but they would be part of your family. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Starting in verse 10 of 1 John 3. John says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, I think uh, most of us, if, if you have siblings, if you're not an only child, which I know there's some out here that are only children, but if you have siblings, you know that they usually know you best. And not in the best way <laughs> that they know you, but they know the most about you. Um, and typically, though, it, it, I can attest, I, um, I have a, a sister. She's two years younger than me. I've ha I have a few step-siblings as well, but they were way older, a lot older than me. I didn't really grow up in that brother-sister context. Um, but uh, I had one um, sister, two, or I have one sister, <laughs> two years younger than me. Most of you guys know her and met her. Um, but growing up, I was not a good brother to her. I was not a good big brother. I was, I was mean. You know, she'd like to be in, she'd, she'd like the music that I started liking, and I didn't like that because it was supposed to be my music, my teenage angsty music that I listened to, not hers. She doesn't have teenage angst. She's, she's you know, treated well. I'm the one that's supposed to listen to this. Then she starts, you know, kind of mingling, intermingling with some of my friends. Hey, these are my friends, not your friends, just mine. Get your own friends. Um, so on and so forth. And I was pretty mean. Um, and uh, it wasn't really until I um, moved out of the house and, and everything, the Lord was able to reconcile us. I praise him for that. But it's so interesting that the people that know us the best, the people we've been through so much with, we seem to treat the worst or, or vice versa. Maybe, maybe you were on the receiving end of that. Maybe you treated your siblings great but they didn't treat you great at all. It's so interesting how that is because, I mean, your siblings are your siblings. There's no changing that. You know, coworkers, you know, they stop being your coworkers once they leave the job or you leave the job. But, you know, we treat them with so much kindness and respect. And, you know, we, we, we honor their time and, and we do things to help them out. Our neighbors, you know, they're our neighbors until they move away or you move away and then they're no longer our neighbors in, in that neighborhood sense. But our siblings, man, we can treat them with such spite, such hate. And for those of us in Christ, we are a part of the family of God and we have siblings in our family, yet for some reason, we can seem to treat them the worst. We can really seem to just focus on all the bad the Christians are doing. <laughs> you know, quite frankly, um, it's, it's interesting to see that when 
um, a brother, when a brother or sister falls, you know, whether they fell into some sin um, or it's revealed, like a, a pastor, it's revealed that a pastor is, um, you know, he, he's been living in adultery or um, drunkenness or whatever it might be. It seems like the church is the one with the swiftest kick, with the hardest punch, with the meanest thing to say. And yet, you know, when it comes to the world, we're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to offend the world. We, we want to, we want to bring them in. It's like, yeah, but once they come in, we just treat them like garbage. <laughs> well, once you're saved, you know, if you're not saved, we'll treat you great, and we'll give you gift baskets, and we'll try and get you in. But once you're in the family, well, who cares? But see, Paul says something in Galatians six ten that a lot of people don't like to hear. A lot of people actually find, in terms of what they think the church should do. They found, find counterintuitive. He says, therefore, in Galatians 6.10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Most people stop there. But then he continues and he says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Especially to those who are of the household of faith. Throughout the scriptures, there's an imperative that we are to treat our brothers and sisters in Christ in a certain way. And, and as Paul says in Galatians 6, even better than those we treat in the world. Even better. If you were to give your coat to someone you didn't know that's not a believer, then you should have no problem giving anything to a believer, to a brother or sister in Christ. But again, for some reason we... And when I say we, I don't necessarily just mean you. I'm not picking on anyone. I'm saying the church is glo uh, globally. You know, church splits. When churches fall and churches split, it's not because of non-believers, right? <laughs> Who's it usually because? Other believers. So if we're told as an imperative, Galatians 6, especially to those who are the household of faith, we're to treat our brothers and sisters in a certain way. How does that look? Well, in these first, five ver first six verses that we read, 1 John 3, verses 10 through 15, we can see that John's writing is very polarizing. And that's because even these, in these sections, he speaks with such stark contrast with such black and white imagery that there's no room for gray. There's no gray area. There's no, well, you know, I like to treat my family, as in Calvary Chapel, Savannah, good, but, you know, them Baptists over there, them Methodists over there, them other non-denominations, those, those sheep stealers, you know, whatever they might, we might want to call them. I don't treat them with as much respect. But notice what Paul says here. He clearly, lay, or Paul, John, he clearly lays out who is a child of God and who is not. He says in verse 10, in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness of God is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Now this word for manifest also translates, and maybe in your Bibles it says this, clearly evident. Clearly evident. That means people can look at you and without a doubt say, yes, they are loving their brother. Yes, they are a child of God. Now, the first thing he says in this verse is that those who do not practice righteousness, which is following the law of God, which is something we spoke on last week. You know, if you're a child of God, there are certain requirements for you as a child of God. But then the second thing he says in verse 10 is that we must love one another. I think one thing before we continue on in this section is we have to understand that, that this topic in the Bible of loving your brothers and sisters is very clear. It's very clear. It's very clear that if we are His children, if I say I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm a disciple of Christ, then I must, I will have to love each my other brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no exception. There is no excuse. There is no gray area. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you must love your brothers and sisters. 
It's very similar to what Jesus says in John 14, 15, where he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The verse in and of itself, especially in our English translation, sounds like Jesus is saying, prove your love to me by keeping my commandments, right? Sounds that way. Sounds the same way here, right? John says, well, you need to prove that you're a child of God by going out and loving all the brothers and sisters. But that's, that's not... Again, our English translation, that's how it reads. But that's not what's being said. What's being said is that if you're a child of God, naturally, or I should say supernaturally naturally, you will love your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's just, there's no way around it. If you have the Holy Spirit of God in you and he's brought you from death to life, then you will love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice what John says a little later on in 1 John 4, verse 20 through 21. He says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, it says he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. If you don't love your brother and yet you say, oh, I love God, you're a liar. That's what the Bible says. That's what John here says. So personally, I love John's writing for this. I, love it. I just love the writing style. There's, you know, when we read Paul, we've been reading a lot of letters of Paul lately, and there's just a lot of like, well, you know, uh, <laughs> we're, we're gonna, you know, the, the, there's, it's been misconceived, it's been this, it's been that, you know, maybe he's speaking about this, maybe he's talking. With John, it's like, I mean, if you don't love your brother, but you say you love God, it's very simple. You're a liar. You are a liar. Another thing with this, this commandment, this thing we're supposed to do, loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's nothing new. Look at verse 11. For this is the message you heard from the, from the beginning that we should love one another. This is what God has been speaking to his people since the beginning about loving each other. In fact, when you look at the Ten Commandments, you have the first five which speak mainly of our relationship to God. You know, don't take his name in vain. Don't have any idols before him. But then the last five of the Ten Commandments, what does it speak of? Our relationship to one another. Don't steal. Don't envy. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't lie. And then later on, Jesus kind of clarifies because, you know, in the law itself, there were, what was it, over 600? I, I might be getting those mixed up, but I think there's over 600 laws in the Bible that the Lord gave his people. Well, Jesus sums them all up very simply. When he's asked, what's the greatest commandment by the Pharisees? And he says, well, love the Lord your God. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul even later on says that all of the law is summed up in this, that we love one another. The whole law is summed up in this. So from the beginning, from the law to now, loving one another has been preached, has been something they should know. Whether they were, uh, you know, and in, in, in John is he's probably speaking to a mixed audience here. There were certainly some Jews. There were certainly some Gentiles. So the Jews, of course, they had the law, so he could point to that. But even to the Gentiles who, di who didn't have the law, he could say, from the beginning of your salvation, this is clearly taught. Jesus even himself said, just like John said in verse 10, that it will be clearly evident, it will be manifest, <laughs> that you are a disciple of me. How? By how thick that Bible is. How worn out that Bible is, brother. You know, How many services you attend in a month. How much you tithe. How many mission trips you've been on. Where you sit in the church. What you do at the church. How many hallelujahs you can give during the sermon. No, it's by your love for one another. 
they will know, they will know without a doubt, it'll be clearly evident, they will know you are my disciples. Why? Because of your love for one another. And if you remember the disciples and their relationship with one another, they were like a bunch of different denominations getting together trying to pick out a place to eat lunch, you know? It never worked. But Jesus looked at them and said, they're going to they're gonna know you're my disciples because you guys are going to love one another. Not fight over who's the greatest, who's got the best worship, who's got the best teaching, who's got the most casual style, who's got the best child care. No, by your love for one another. That's how they'll know. It's clearly evident. And then in verse 12, continuing on, he talks about what we do when we do not love our brother, right? Why is it such a big deal to love our brother? Or, or can I not love my brother but not hate my brother? Well, verse 12 he says, not as Cain who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. One of the most infamous stories in the Bible is Cain and Abel for a couple of reasons. The first is it was the first murder that ever happened on planet Earth, of a human at least. We know in the garden, God had to sacrifice an animal to cover up Adam and Eve once they sinned. That wasn't a murder. It wasn't the first death, but it was the first murder where another human took another human's life. And from then on, it has just been bloodshed after bloodshed after bloodshed, right? But what's also interesting about that story is it was brothers. It was a brother. It wasn't a rival clan or tribe. They were brothers. Which is why John here is using this. John says that if we're children of God, there's no way that we can go out of our way to hate another brother or sister in Christ. It just doesn't add up. So John's saying if, if we don't love our brothers, then we hate them. And if we hate them, then we're guilty of the same sin as Cain when he murdered his brother Abel. Which is nothing new for us either because Jesus even said, if you hate someone, it's as if you murdered them. Just like when he said, if you look on a woman with lust, it's as if you've already committed the act with her. So if we hate our brothers, if we, well, I'm not even going to say if we hate our, if we don't love our brothers, again, there's no gray area, then you hate them, and if you hate them, then you've murdered them. As he continues on, he says, Do not marvel, my brethren. If the world hates you, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother, again, he, doesn't, he, he clarifies. It's not just he who hates his brother, but he who does not love his brother abides in death. And whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Again, that's when John says here that there's no way we can go out of our way for a child of God, it doesn't add up that we go out of our way to hate one of our brothers or sisters, to murder one of our brothers and sisters. That is not a fruit of the Spirit. And if you're a child of God, you have the Spirit inside you. So now that we know that we should not hate them, and we actually should not just not hate them, but we should actually love them, what does that look like? Right? Because I, I can see the little five-year-old and all of us saying, I, don't, I, I have to love them, but I don't have to like them. <laughs> I mean, how many times did your teachers or your parents tell you that? You have to love them, you, but you don't have to like them. Don't worry. Or, you know, is the little five-year-old, you know, um, the parent tells them to, to sit down. And they say, I'm, I'll sit down, but I'm standing on the inside. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I can see all of us now. Okay, well, I'll love them, but... What does that love look like? Verse 16. 
By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. What does the love for the brethren look like? Well, John says it here, it looks like Jesus. It is embodied in what Jesus has done for us. That is the bare minimum of love that we're to give to our brothers and sisters in Christ. The bare minimum is what Jesus did for us. Because we're, we're, we're built like that, right? We're built where we are, are we still have this, the nature of sin that that still wants to try and control us, even though it does have no power over us. It still has influence in our lives. And it still is telling us, love your brother, but find out the bare minimum that you have to do. Find out the least amount of love that you have to give that counts as love. And be okay with that. I mean, we probably don't say those words, but we a lot of times act that way, right? What is the least amount that I can do while still, I mean, it, it's like in, in high school when you're, or college when your teacher said, write a thousand word pa paper. And you got to word nine, you know, you had, um, you had a whole paragraph left to say, but you're at a thousand words already. I think that's enough. She only said a thousand words. That'll be good enough. I don't want to be an overachiever. I don't want to be a kiss up to the teacher. But the bare minimum that we have as the children of God is to do what God did for us. Right? By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren in verse 16. We need to lay down our lives for the brethren. Yes, this is speaking literally if the moment were to come. All right? It's, it's not saying now, right now, you'd, I'm going to go die for you when there's no reason that you need to die for them. But the New Testament speaks about this in so many other ways as well. And even in the next verse, we'll see. But Paul speaks about giving up our rights for the weaker brothers in 1 Corinthians and in Romans. How we might have this liberty to do certain things, but we're going to lay aside our liberties and our rights because our other brother doesn't have that liberty maybe. And it might cause them to stumble. It might cause them to start sinning. And I'd rather my brother or sister not sin than me enjoy this meal or do this thing. That is okay. But you know, I'm going to give up those things. Why? Why? Not because the Bible's mean and wants you to have a miserable life. It's because Jesus did that for us. Because this is what love is. What Christ did. Christ came down and became a man. Didn't have to. But he wanted to. And why did he do it? Did he get anything out of that exchange? No, because we know that one day every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. He could have just waited. And just forced us all to bow down and worship him. Right? No, but he, he gained nothing from that exchange. He became one of us. He suffered like us. He en endured like us. He had family. He had siblings. <laughs> In fact, his siblings weren't that great. They thought he was crazy. You know, if it was... In, in today's day and age, they would have, you know, Baker acted him, put him in a psych ward. But he showed love. And he said, and John here says, that's the same kind of love we're supposed to have. In fact, <laughs> Jesus has an interesting exchange with Peter right before he's, he ascends to the Father after he... After he is resurrected. He says, Peter, do you love me? And he, he was asking him, do you agape me? Because in the Greek, there's, um, 
more than one word for love. We have love, and love means love, and you know, it means the context of the word means so many different things, right? Well, Greek, Koine Greek in that time had a few different words for love. Agape meant self-sacrificing, unconditional love. And anytime the Bible is speaking about the love of God, it's speaking about this agape love. And so when Jesus is speaking to Peter, he says, Jesus, do you agape me? Do you unconditionally, self-sacrificially love me? And Peter answers him back. He says, Lord, I phileo you, which is another Greek word for love, which means brotherly love, which means like two kindred spirits, you know, buddies, but they still kind of annoy you every now and then. <laughs> and he kept asking him, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter's like, I phileo you. John here is telling us that we need to agape, unconditionally, self-sacrificially love the brethren. And then, Again, you know, some of us say, well, I'm probably never going to be in a situation where I need to physically lay down my life for my brothers or sisters in Christ. I mean, in America, we're not at that point yet where we're being physically persecuted for our faith. But look at verse 17. He says, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? See, we're to give to our brethren when they are in need. And that's how we show love. That's how we self-sacrifice. Your brother's hungry, feed him. Thirsty, feed him. Needs clothing, give him clothing. That's showing the agape love of God. You don't have to take a bullet for them to show them that love. And then I think John says something here in verse 18 that should cut to all of our hearts. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I think none of us should really be able to sit there and go, yeah, amen, mm-hmm, I got it, that's me. I don't think any of us have this figured out completely. Let our, our love not just be in word and tongue, not just be something we say. Love you, brother. Hey, can you help me move? Oh. Love you, brother. All right, we're going to go. <laughs> Let our love not just be in word and tongue, but in deed and truth. Look, look how the NLT says this verse. Dear children, let us, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. So it's, yeah, it's a good thing to say that we love each other. And we can tell non-believers, oh, we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, let's show it. Then why are we constantly bickering? Why are we constantly butting heads? Why are we constantly at odds with one another? Our love for one another should be clearly evident not by our speech, but by our actions. It's that same thought process that James had when he said, without, faith, without works, our faith is dead. The same could be said, without works, our love is dead. If we simply just say we love each other, that we love everyone, I mean, it, in a marriage relationship, we know we wouldn't get away with that, right guys? You know, I tell, oh, I tell my wife every day I love her. Yet I spend no time with her. Can't remember her birth date. Never do anything for her. I'm always going out with the guys. She never gets a chance to go out with the girls. It's all about me. Or maybe even worse, we say we love them and then we're out there cheating on them. Committing adultery. Let us not love in word and tongue, but in deed and in truth. Our love is something that we do. Not something we just say. And again, in our, in our American culture and context, that's, 
that's one part of the culture that's invaded the church. We can just say things and all of a sudden it, it happens as if it's some sort of magical thing, you know. Uh, there's churches that, that believe you can speak things into existence. The Bible doesn't speak about that at all. Just speak it and it'll happen. Speak positive thoughts and you'll, positive things will happen. I thought positive thoughts and some bad things have happened, right? <laughs> thought negative thoughts, some good things have happened. But as his children, we're not just to say we love one another, we're to actually show it, we're to actually do it. And then in verse 19, he says that this is how we know that we're his children, that we love the brethren by our works. And then in verse 20, he says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, quite frankly, up to this point, it could seem pretty heavy for us to hear. It could seem very burdensome. All right, now you guys need to go show your love for one another. Go prove it to them now. All right, John's telling us to lay down our lives for each other. But John's also telling us, he, you know, I think John knows who he's speaking to. He's speaking to people who constantly fail at this, who constantly don't love their brothers and sisters. And this could easily cause us to condemn ourselves. Maybe even you right now are, are thinking of an opportunity you had recently to love a brother or sister and you blew it. And John says, how dare you? Why are you even here? No, he says, if your heart condemns you, notice what he says, verse 20, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Even when we fail, as his child, God is greater than our failure. God is greater than our condemnation. It, it, it's not up to us if we miss an opportunity to love on our brothers, if we fail, it doesn't mean we're no longer saved as if our salvation was built upon our works and the love that we have to give. Again, it's, not, it's like in John 14, 15. Jesus isn't saying, prove your love to me by keeping my commandments. He just says the natural outworking of my spirit in you is you'll keep my commandments. The natural outworking of my spirit in you is that you'll love one another. But when you don't, that's okay. Because I have grace for you. In John four ten, in First John four ten, notice what he says. It's not about our love. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. It's not about our love towards God. It's not about our love towards people. It's about His love toward us. It's not up to our judgment. It's up to His. Thank, thank the Lord, right? Imagine if our salvation was up to us and our judgment. None of us would be saved. We're our, our own worst critics, right? Right? But thank God it's not up to us. Thank God it's not up to anyone else either. I'm, I'm glad my salvation is not up to you guys. <laughs> you should be glad it's not up to me. It's up to the Lord. And, and what did he do? He sent his son. He loved us first. And then he even says, look, maybe you don't condemn yourselves. Maybe you actually are pretty loving towards your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's great. But have that confidence not in your own love, not in your own actions, but have that confidence toward God. That's what he says in verse 21. And then he says in verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. 
God only requires that we believe in his son and that we love one another. All right, that's, that's loving God with all your heart and that's loving one another, which is what Christ said are the two greatest commandments. In them sums up, fills up, fulfills all the law. If you do those two things, you, it's, you cannot break the law of God. Now as people, we will, because there'll be times when we don't love God and there'll be times when we don't love one another. And so we're gonna do those, break one of those commandments. But God only requires that we believe and that we love. Now, this morning, John is saying, what he's saying here is very frank, very, again, very black and white. There's no gray area. There's no, you know, well, you know, if you look at the context of the first century church and John, where he was writing from, and that style of paper that he wrote on, what John's not as actually saying, no, it's very frank. It's very, none of us can leave here saying, well, I don't, I don't think he was talking about those brothers or sisters in Christ. And those are more like my cousins in Christ. <laughs> my half-brothers or sisters, my step-brothers or sisters in Christ. There's no mystery here to decipher. If we are his children, then we will, we must love one another. There's no other mark for the believer. Our love, there's no other mark for the believer. In fact, Paul in Galatians says, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Is love. And then... He's got a, a bunch of explanations of what that love looks like. Peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I probably missed one. I always do. But the key there is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. They will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. We must love one another. But we can only give what we have received. And we have received such an amazing love. We have received an unconditional love that will last forever. And that is the love that Christ gave us. And that is the love that we should give one another. And again, that's not just speaking about Calvary Chapel, Savannah. That's speaking about every believer in Christ. The ones who, you know, run down the aisles with flags and ram's horns on Sundays. Love them. The ones who wear suit and ties and, you know, are kind of... Mm, you know, they just talk like this all the time. Love them. The ones who meet in the big church buildings, the ones who meet in the houses, love them. The one whose skin color looks different than you. The one who might even have a different political affiliation than you, love them. The one who lives in a different neighborhood than you, love them. And what kind of love? Well, brother, I love you, but I don't like you. No, unconditional love it's practical too it's not just a handshake on a Sunday morning but it's weeping with them in the middle of the night it's not just a euphemism expressed by word but it's an act that requires us to lay ourselves aside for the sake of another this is the requirement for being in the family of God. But again, we can only give what we have received and we have received such a great love. By this we know love. Look back at verse 16. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. Jesus Christ became a man, died for us because we couldn't do it. because we were lacking, because we needed it. And he gained nothing from it. He wanted to bring us into the family of God. He went out of his way to bring us into the family of God. And you, can, you can't love anyone until you experience this love. And so if that's you this morning, I, I invite you to experience that love. As he says, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. All you have to do is believe on the name of Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. So Lord, we thank you for that love that you have shown to us. Lord, w without that, you know, we could sit here and we could speculate on how we're supposed to do it. And if we did that, Lord, we would just be doing the bare minimum. 
we would be saying, well, I don't hate them. I just don't like them. Or we would just be expressing it in word. Lord, I'm thankful that your love is not just expressed in word, but it was expressed on the cross for our sins. And Lord, that's the kind of love that we're required as your children to have for one another. So Lord, I pray right now, fill us with your spirit because the fruit of the spirit is that love. We can't love without, that, without your spirit. Lord, help us to love the ones that we think are the hardest to love. And not just say, okay, well, I just need to say that I love them. Lord, make it practical in our lives. Show us the ways that we can practically love one another. Lord, if someone is in need, that we would fulfill that need because you've blessed us to be able to fulfill that need. Lord, I pray for anyone who doesn't know you, who hasn't experienced that love. I pray that they would believe on your son, Jesus Christ, right now. Repent of their sins, Lord. Believe on you, knowing that they will be saved. They're in the family of God. Lord, the world's family is corrupt. It's broken. We see that in our own blood families, right? Lord, but you've invited us into a new family. One where a divorce can't separate, a house can't be foreclosed on. Where we have the greatest father, the greatest family. So Lord, help us love one another so people will clearly see that we're your disciples. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, why don't we stand for